Welcome everyone to the next show of CFO Inside TV. I'm very happy that you've decided to join us again. And I'm also very happy to welcome as our guest today, Harold James, Professor of History and International Affairs at Princeton University. Welcome, Mr. James. I'm very pleased to be here. Thank you. Well, glad that you made it um, to come to Europe. Um, in your latest book, um, on the Eurozone crisis. Um, you make a couple of interesting observations about the fundamental flaws of the Eurozone, which we will talk about in a minute. Um, but you also make the observation that the Euro is a pure currency. Can you, can you elaborate a little bit on what you mean by pure currency? It's a very interesting historical occurrence because in general for centuries, I think even for thousands of years, money has been associated with the state and the euro was really a deliberate attempt to decouple the idea of the issuing of a stable money from the state without having the kind of metallic background obviously that currencies yeah. had had for much of history. Pure in the terms of a money that is separate from a state. Um, that's exactly the problem that many say is at the core of the euro. Do you think money without a state can work? I think it can work and it has worked in some circumstances in the past. Uh, there have been really quite stable currency unions. Uh, can you but, name some? Well, sure. Uh, the uh, CFA franc zone, for instance, works very, very stably for very long periods yeah. of time. Uh, Benelux had a currency union. I mean, I know it's a very small country and a larger country. The UK and Ireland uh, for 50 years. Uh, there, there are plenty of examples okay. of this. You also say there's a couple of myths, wrong myths, about the creation of the Eurozone, um, mainly based around Germany um, and how Germany was integrated in Europe. What is the wrong myth and what do you think is the real reason for why the Eurozone was created? Well, particularly, I think, uh, people who come from my side of the Atlantic, from the United <laughs> States, uh, have this very peculiar view of this and they see uh, this as being a project because of this, this kind of novelty that was really couldn't have been justified by any economic rationale but must have been justified for some kind of political reason. And many Europeans will say this as well, that the fundamental mm. idea of the euro was to create peace between European countries uh, but that the economics wasn't so well thought out. That, that I think is wrong. Okay, what's your, what's your, what's your perspective? Uh, what I do in the book is to think about the way that the currency integrated, the monetary integration was devised as a solution to problems of the international financial system, to instabilities in the international financial system, in particular to big questions about the role of the US dollar in the international system that come up regularly at periodic intervals in the late 1960s and early 1970s and the 19 late 1970s again and in the late 1980s. So basically you would say the euro was partly created as a competitor to the US dollar? It, it was designed to create, uh, to solve a problem in the international monetary system, not, not as a competitor to the US dollar, although I think as, a, as, as an accompaniment to the US dollar, the perception is that a system that's based on the US dollar alone is unworkable. Would you say the euro succeeded in that, in that attempt? Or is it too early to, to tell? I, I, I know, I think it has succeeded. And I, I think it's the beginning of something that will uh, be a story of currency diversification that we will think of the renminbi as having a similar role as well. Okay. But at the same time, you say there's a couple of fundamental design flaws in the Eurozone system. Which, which would they be? What I was struck by was how accurately those design flaws were identified in the early 1990s, uh, in particular. In advance. Two, in, in advance. I mean, in two, two, two areas. One, the question of fiscal rules, because it was rightly thought that market discipline alone wouldn't be enough to restrain governments from abusive fiscal behavior. Mm. And secondly, the question of banking supervision, common banking supervision and regulation in a common currency area with a common capital market, with a single e economic area, uh, you need banking supervision and regulation, yeah. a common supervision and banking regulation framework. And that was also thought about in the early 1990s, but then rejected. Would, would you say the, the, 
uh, what I would call birth pains of uh, the Eurozone that is going through now because it's still comparatively young. Is that something any currency goes through when it's after its inception? Or is that purely because of those faults or flaws in, in, in the design of the Euro? I think inevitably the institutions that are associated with the currency, uh, the central bank that issues the currency, um, the design needs to be adapted and changed from time mm. to time. And we saw that very dramatically in the case of the United States history that the Federal Reserve came into being in 1914. Mm. But clearly in the Depression, the Depression showed up flaws in the 1914 design. And so the 1933 Act substantially changed the structure of the Fed and gave the Fed some of the powers that were critical in 2008. Mm. Would you say policymakers and central bankers back then had more time to address flaws compared to today's world? Or was it basically the same time pressure, decision-making pressure as we face today? You almost always, I think, uh, by logic, address the flaws when it's too late. Uh, so in that sense, you're, you're always reacting to something bad reacting. that's happened. And uh, there's, there's a sense of urgency and there's a sense that this could have been done differently okay. if it had been thought out in a different way. How do you think the Eurozone can become more resistant to, to, to shocks or can, how can it resolve its flaws? The, the needs to be, first of all, the actual substantive details on the banking supervision regulation. That, that's a very important part of the redesign of the euro. Um, that's being worked on. Uh, there needs to be also more in the way of coordinated fiscal discipline. Again, that's, that's, that's being worked on. So there, there are areas where th there's progress being made. Uh, but I think in the end, uh, you need also some sort of fiscal capacity mm. to deal with common problems. And that hasn't really adequately been dealt with yet. Uh, so in my view, uh, the Eurozone or the European Union or both together are going to need to develop more of a fiscal capacity in order to be able to deal with issues such as bank resolution. Okay, excellent. Well, thank you, Professor James, for those uh, interesting thoughts. And as always, we have three very short final questions with requests for very short answers. Um, my first one would be, all things considered, was the creation of the euro a good or a bad idea? A good idea. And do you think the euro will still be around in 20 years from now? Yes. And um, will we see another major currency union um, being established somewhere else in the world within the next 20 years? I, I think it's a real possibility, yes. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much for joining mm. us for this first um, talk in a series of two talks with Professor Harold James. You're going to have um, a second talk next week on uh, a slightly different issue of globalization, again with Professor Harold James. And I hope you'll be joining us again for next week's edition of CFO Inside TV. Thank you and goodbye.